So, welcome to Introduction to Birding, um, and uh, I will be your host for the next four and a half to five hours. Uh, we're going to talk about a few things, including this, our mascot bird for this year's uh, effort, is the acorn woodpecker. And you can see there that range map, the purple color indicates where this bird can be found year round. And this stretches all the way into Central, Central America, but in North America, at least north of the border, it's restricted to California, Oregon, a little bit of Arizona and New Mexico and, and um, Big Bend in Texas. So it's a pretty restricted range in the United States, but it's very common here. And that's why we decided to make it the mascot for this year's great backyard bird count. Um, if you want to stop and get one of these stickers or one of these window uh, static clings, you know, stop by the ranch and pick some up. We've got plenty to hand out. And what you'll be saying by displaying it is that you're taking part in an important annual scientific community, scientific um, activity. So you're helping quite a bit and uh, showing it by displaying this decal. So the Backyard Bird Counts, just so you know, is a uh, annual four-day event that's sponsored by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, National Audubon and all the chapters, and then uh, Birds Canada, which is sort of the equivalent of Audubon uh, north of the border. I'm Matthew Dotter, Executive Director of Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, and you can find our website right there, scvas.org. And I imagine most of you have already seen that, but just in case. <clears throat> so, uh, since 1925, we've been inspiring people to take uh, an interest in birds, to care about birds. And that's important because we're coming up on a 100 year anniversary, and that's going to be a great big deal. So, maybe you'll be around to enjoy some of the festivities that happened then. But I want to start off with a few facts. There are 50 million people in the United States that call themselves birders, and this is actually an old statistic, 2016. So, I imagine it's even more now. And Another interesting fact is that Santa Clara County alone has got 413 species of birds. That's quite a lot for one uh, medium sized county. <clears throat> and we're going to give you some tips on how to recognize just a few of those, I think 20, 24, something like that. Birds that you will probably find in your backyard and neighborhood. I want to make sure that people are familiar with a few um, kind of fundamental concepts, the concept of field marks. A simple example of a field mark would be this red patch on the on the wing of this red winged blackbird. That's actually what it's called, and it has red wings. And it's very funny when a non-birder says, "What's that bird? That black bird that's got the red wing?" And you get to say rather smugly, "It's a red winged blackbird." So uh, this is a really good example of a field mark. And here are two more examples of field marks: things that you might want to recognize, notice when you're looking at a bird in order to help you identify it. The eyebrow on this Buick's wren, which is also called a supercilium, and the bars on the wings here, key features for wrens like this Buick's wren. The bars on the tail of this red-shouldered hawk and the checkerboard pattern on the wings and the rufous coloration on the, on the wings as well and on the breast, all fabulous field marks. But we also wanna be sensitive to habitats and habitat uh, is pretty much anywhere you look, anywhere you bird or walk or run or, or stroll, what have you, is a habitat of sorts. The tidal wetland, of Palo Alto Baylands is a great habitat. The oak savanna up in our hills near uh, see Rancho San Antonio would be a perfect example of that. The old growth uh, woodland, mostly uh, redwoods and dug firs. Different habitats as is uh, the chaparral hillsides um, above Stevens Canyon Road or the riparian woodland of Stevens Creek where I work. I work in a building which is right across from this beautiful meadow. And your neighborhood park has plenty of habitat in it, as does your backyard itself. All these bushes, some are native, some are exotic. Most are exotic, I would, I would guess by looking at this picture, but birds can be found here just as easily and sometimes just as abundantly as anywhere else. So there are a variety of birds that can be found in each of the habitats I just showed you, and some of them are very specific to those habitats. We'll get to that later. Behavior is another thing you want to watch for when you're trying to identify a bird. Is it climbing up a tree like this Nuttles woodpecker? Is it hovering near an azalea bush like this uh, Anna's hummingbird? Or is it feeding on the ground like many of our sparrows, including this dark-eyed junco? And 
Is it climbing down a tree? This would be a key feature to notice on our white-breasted nuthatch. These are all very common birds, which I'm quite sure you have in your neighborhoods. So behavior is just as useful as field marks for identification. And so are sounds. I'm gonna play you three sounds and you'll notice right away how different they are. And that's really the most important thing to notice. I wouldn't worry too much about remembering this song at the moment, but maybe you'll recognize it because I imagine you've heard this before. That was pretty loud, I apologize for that. And this Anna's Hummingbird, you might've heard this. So for such a beautiful bird, it has kind of a squeaky, um, scrapey kind of song, uh, not, not nearly as attractive as the, the bird's uh, bright red feathers. The red-tailed hawk, I guarantee if you've watched a Western movie, you've heard this call. They play this every time they wish to um, communicate uh, a bird of prey. But that sound is really unique to red-tailed hawk, uh, one of our most common uh, birds of prey here. So here's another fact. Experienced birders use their ears as much as their eyes. Now, some actual tool, a thing that you will need to have with you um, at some point would be a field guide. And they are available for everywhere on earth. And I do mean literally everywhere on earth has got at least one field guide dedicated to finding birds there. Here are just a few examples of birds of North America, field guides for birds of North America. I have a huge library of field guides. I've got all of these and they're all useful and they all work just fine. But there are two that we really strongly recommend, the Sibley Guide to Birds and the National Geographic Guide to uh, Birds in North America. These are both very, very current. You can see seventh edition for the National Geographic Guide. These are updated every few years, as opposed to once or twice um, uh, over the decade. So really worthwhile to pick up one of these guides. Um, again, I've got both of these and, and I don't know which one to recommend more. National Geographic is a little bit smaller so if that's a concern, you might use that one. When you open up a field guide, you're gonna see a bunch of stuff in the beginning of the book, such as this topographic um, drawing illustration, which highlights different aspects of the bird's um, topography. Different features like that supercilium, that eyebrow I pointed out on the Buick's Wren. And when you open the book to the, the body of the book and you start getting into the illustrations of birds you're going to find several things, a family overview for the ducks in this case, which gives you a few details about what makes a duck a duck. You'll find a species description and the name of each species, and you'll find a range map. But probably the thing that people notice first are the illustrations of the birds. And when you zoom in on these, you'll see these illustrations have lots of features called out. These are field marks that the a field guide is pointing out to you with either arrows or lines or just text beside the bird. And you'll also see an indication of whether it's a male, a female, or an immature bird. These are really helpful, especially with ducks, where the males and females often look completely different. When you get into the text of these uh, species accounts, you'll see a number of things. So the family overview will include some features about behavior, uh, in, in addition to the name of each bird, you'll find descriptions of the male and female plumages. You'll find mentions of the voice, any vocalizations it makes, and um, a suggestion of the habitat that it likes. So all very useful. There's quite a bit packed into this paragraph of text. But I think, to me, one of the things I find most useful is the map. The red color represents the warm months of the year. Uh, July, uh, the spring through summer. Makes sense. Red is warm. Uh, blue is cold. That's where the bird spends its winter. And where you mix blue and red, of course, you get purple, which means that the bird is present in that area year round. So again, you can learn an awful lot by looking at these maps and these illustrations. <clears throat> I'm assuming most of you have binoculars already, but if you don't, I'll just give you a quick rundown on binocs. <clears throat> Whether you're using your grandfather's old pair of binoculars that he used to use 
at the football game, or you're using something new that you just bought at a sporting goods store, they're all going to work. Um, I recommend this particular brand, Vortex, because they're, they're quite modestly priced, and they come in a lot of different sizes and shapes and magnifications. The 8x42 is usually the one we must recommend most highly. And if you want to get a look at binoculars up close and try them out, uh, the Bass Pro Shop in San, uh, San Jose is a very good place to go. They've got lots of binoculars, and if you tell them that you're interested in birding, uh, they could probably steer you toward the right selection. And you'll pick them up and try them and see which ones you like, which ones you can afford. But you can see the prices start at about $100, and they go quite a bit higher. <clears throat> so uh, with no further ado, let's look at some of the birds that we're going to look for uh, during the Great Backyard Bird Count. And when you look at the pictures, try to notice to yourself uh, some of the field marks that you think would be important when you're looking at the bird. And I'll try to point them out as we go through. But uh, this is what you'll be doing uh, when you go out birding on the Backyard Bird Count. You're going to be looking for field marks. And the first one will be the acorn woodpecker. <clears throat> we have a lot of these at the ranch. So I see and hear these every single day. They come to our bird feeders occasionally too. But they're definitely making a lot of noise in the trees above us. So looking at this bird, I can see a bunch of things that I would want to take note of. And I'm just gonna call out a few of them here, the red on the, on the head, the crown, and the white eye, and the black and white facial pattern, and that black bib. Um, and it's that weird feet with two toes faced forward and two toes back, that's typical for woodpeckers. That might be harder to see, but certainly the plumage is easy to see, and that, that stiff pointed tail is pretty easy to see. And if you could see all of these features, that's great. But sometimes you just get away with one or two, and that's usually enough to help you identify the bird. So looking at this bird, <clears throat> this is the same species, but there's something different about it. And I wonder if you can tell what it is. <clears throat> if I show you the previous picture, maybe it's a little bit easier now. I'm hoping that somebody will notice that the bird on the left has got more black on it. This is because this is a female. The one on the right is a male with more red. So that simple feature tells us quite a bit about the acorn woodpecker, <clears throat> male and female. Now, male and female doesn't help you, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not that significant when you're making a checklist. But it's just very nice to know. It, it gives you some information that you didn't know before. So here is the... <clears throat> You've probably heard that call before. They love phone poles, they love oak trees, and they stuff those trees and those poles with nuts, with acorns. And they do that because they're going to eat those during lean times. They know exactly when to harvest them. They dry them out. They dry them out for a certain distance, and then they um, har harvest them later on. These trees are called granaries, and they form colonies around their granaries. So they've made all these holes, and they put those those um, acorns in there for later, and they protect those trees, those granary trees. And so sometimes you'll see many, many acorn woodpeckers in one tree. That's because that's a granary. A second woodpecker that's very common in our backyards and neighborhoods is the Nuttles woodpecker. This is a male with a lot of red, and here's the female with no red. You see she's got a caterpillar there. So this is a pretty handsome, smaller, uh, smaller woodpecker than the acorn, and has a pretty distinctive rattling call. This is a male feeding a young bird at the nest hole. This is, a, I think, a slow motion video of it extracting some food from between the cracks in the bark. And you'll see it yank out a grub or something. There we go. Yeah, that's what woodpeckers like to eat. <clears throat> White-breasted nuthatch. I bet you remember this is the bird that climbs down. And look at that big, heavy uh, claw on the back of the foot. That helps it climb downward on the tree. There it is again. See how large and hook-like that is? That's really going to dig into the wood and give it a good grip as it's climbing straight down like this, or even upside down. 
This is a pretty fun bird to watch. It's rather small and it loves eating nuts, peanuts, um, walnuts, anything like that. And what it does, is it takes, it doesn't swallow them whole. What it does, it takes them and jams them into a little uh, uh, piece of, between a piece of wood and then tries to hammer it open with its that chisel-like bill. So a couple of behaviors <clears throat> that you can use to identify it, that, that up that down uh, downhill climbing and the chiseling open of nuts that it kind of wedges in between two pieces of wood. And again, very common at your backyard feeder. Anna's hummingbird visits feeders too, but it doesn't eat seeds, it eats just nectar. And if you've seen Anna's hummingbird before, you know that the feathers on the throat actually usually are black. And it's only once in a while when the bird turns its head slightly and catches the light that the gorget um, refracts the light back to us on a very, very narrow frequency of light, a bandwidth of light. So uh, the feathers are actually black, but they're prismatic. They're transparent and they're prismatic. So they've been sculpted in such a way to capture and refract the light. This is why we see these brilliant metallic colors. Here's the male again, um, foraging at a uh, flowering bush. And that that wonderful scraping call again. <clears throat> the female doesn't have the red gorget. Uh, she sometimes has a little red spot, but not much. Else. And here is the female on the nest. And if you've ever seen one of these, uh, if you have not seen one of these, you'd, you'd be impressed to know that this is no larger than a cotton ball, that nest. And it's made out of spider webs and lichen. It's just the most delicate thing, um, tiny, tiny, and it barely, you barely see it in the tree, but it can fit uh, two monstrous chicks when it has to, because it's very flexible and stretchy. Black Phoebe, this is a pretty fun bird to watch. It's very active and it dodge dashes back and forth over the wet grass and looking for insects. This is one of our fly catchers. It, it eats almost uh, only flying insects, but during the spring, it'll also catch caterpillars. And um, we have it year round. It's black with a white belly, it kind of looks like it's wearing a tuxedo. And it has a pretty distinctive call. So here's a, an adult feeding two young black Phoebes. And they're really entertaining to watch. They're very active. They have a lot of character. And they, they call almost constantly. But my guess is that you have one of these uh, somewhere very close to your home, whether it's right out front your front door or in the driveway or down the street. This is a very common bird. And for a lot of people, it's the first bird that they really notice. California scrub jay. A lot of people uh, think we've got blue jays here. In fact, we don't. We've got scrub jays, and the California scrub jay is, is our particular brand of scrub jay. It doesn't have a crest like the East Coast uh, blue jay, but it is bright blue. And it's very fond of oak trees and oak woodland, but you can also find it in chaparral and other areas, even backyards, and it will visit feeders, especially if you've got peanuts. It loves acorns too. And what it does is it'll take acorns from the trees or from the ground and it'll bury them. Now, jays are smart, but they're, they don't have a great memory. So they only remember where about a third or a quarter of the acorns are buried, which means that three quarters of the acorns are actually in the ground ready to sprout. So in a very real way, scrub jays are great conservationists. I'm sure everybody recognizes that sound. <clears throat> so these are really fun to watch. They're very intelligent birds and they're, they're pretty fun, um, but they're mischievous. And they're also uh, bullies sometimes when they come to a feeder, they take over. Now, another bird that's very common in one's backyard and backyard feeder was the California towhee. Pretty nondescript. This is a large long-tailed sparrow 
um, with very few markings on it that uh, one could call field marks. But the uniformity of the brown coloration and that, that kind of conical bill, those are good field marks. You might have recognized this call was in the background of an earlier recording. I think it was the Anna's Hummingbird had a California towhee calling in the background. So here is a good field mark to look for in a California towhee. Remember, this is a sparrow, but it's a it's a big sparrow. And it's got a longish tail, but you see that kind of cinnamon color um, underneath the tail? It's called a vent. That area has, is a pretty good field mark. Not very many birds have that mark. And then around the face, there's some really pretty sort of nutmeg or cinnamon coloration. When you get this bird up close, it's really quite fetching, but um, for, at a distance, it's uh, rather uh, uniform and uh, not, uh, not that many features. <clears throat> However, its close relative, the cousin, the spotted toey, is spectacular by comparison. So this has uh, three colors, black, rufous, white, with a bright red eye, and it's really got some great markings on it. Those spots on the back and the wings, that's how it gets its name. <clears throat> So it kind of sounds maybe like a cat with a sore throat, I don't know. But it's much shyer than the California towhee, and it will it'll uh, hide deep in the bushes in the tangles, the blackberry tangle or a brush pile. It doesn't like to be seen very much, but if you do see it fly, you'll notice these, these bright white field marks on the tail, these bright white spots. Uh, very few birds have got marks like this. And even if you get a fleeting glimpse of it as it passes between two bushes, you might notice that. Chestnut back chickadee. Everybody loves the chickadees. They're, they're tiny, they're adorable, and um, they're just very, very pretty and cute. Uh, they're highly acrobatic. They come in good numbers. They love bird feeders. And <clears throat> its song is really distinctive. It, it almost sounds, this is how it gets its name, it almost sounds like it's saying chickadee, chickadee. So that's, that's where all the chickadees, and there are several kinds of chickadees, but this is the one we've got here. They all have that chickadee call. And here's a, some nice footage. So what you might have noticed is that chickadee went into the nest without anything, but it came out with something. And what it was carrying was basically a garbage can, a garbage bag. It's called a fecal sack. And uh, the, the young birds create uh, poop inside the nest and the adult gathers it all together um, and kind of wraps it up in a little bundle and then takes it away and takes it far away so that predators won't, uh, won't smell it. But that's the chickadee is a good housekeeper. Many birds do that as well. The oak titmouse is a really close relative, but much uh, plainer looking. It's gray and it has um, a crest. So kind of like uh, some of our other birds do, like the blue jay on the East Coast has got a crest. So its call is a little harsher, not as cute sounding, a little rougher, a little bit more hoarse. So you can tell that picture was taken in spring because it's holding a caterpillar. Of course, a lot of our songbirds, even though they do visit seed feeders during the winter, they really prefer to have uh, wiggling protein and fat heavy, fat rich caterpillars to feed their young. <clears throat> Buick's red. Remember we saw this before with the supercilium and the bars on the tail and the wings. Um, this has got a I guarantee you've got one of these in your neighborhood. Um, and the song you might recognize. It actually appeared in one of the earlier recordings as a background bird. But this is pretty small, smaller than our sparrows. It's got a tail which it tends to cock upright. It's got that strong supercilium and that long, very curved, slender bill. 
but it's not like a sparrow. Sparrows tend to have chunkier, heavier bills. And here's a, an adult with a spider, it looks like, and uh, getting ready to feed a, a young Buick's wren. Red-tailed hawk, I already played you the, the, the sound, you recognize it. This is the adult, actually does have a red tail. The young bird, though, does not. But this is probably the most common hawk we have in the area. So if you're seeing a hawk, chances are it's a red tail, even if you don't see a red tail. Now, it's not always the case, but it's important to remember that this is the most common hawk we have. It's common on roadsides, it's common over meadows, it's common on phone poles and fences when you get out in the um, open country. It's pretty abundant. And when they start to set up their nest, the male and female will do a courtship display like this where they dangle their legs down, and they almost land on the other one. Of course, they've got that great call, which you hear as they're circling overhead. They eat mammals, ground mammals, and small reptiles. So that would be anything from um, a ground squirrel, if they're feeling uh, saucy and can handle up such a big prey, but they'll be eating mice, squirrels, um, small rabbits, and then snakes and lizards and things of that sort. <clears throat> Very rarely does a, the uh, red-tailed hawk eat birds, but the red-shouldered hawk does. This hawk is quite a bit smaller and lives along creeks. So if you live anywhere near a creek, chances are you've got a red-shouldered hawk calling and uh, you making use of those trees and it does actually eat a lot of birds. This is a pair here very much like the pair we've got at McClellan Ranch. They've nested there for several years in a row. I assume they'll nest again this year and this is the call they make. How'd you like to live with that? Listen to that all day, 24 hours a day, um, at, well eight hours a day at the ranch where I work. They're calling like that all the time just outside my office. So kind of like the red tail that doesn't have a red tail when it's young, the red shouldered hawk doesn't have a red tail, uh, uh, a <coughs> does not have the heavy bands on the tail, it has delicate bands. But I, uh, I assume you could still use that sound to help you identify it. Cooper's hawk, yet another predator. If you've got a bird feeder in your backyard, chances are you've got a Cooper's hawk in your neighborhood somewhere watching that feeder. So they love eating birds. They specialize in catching birds on the wing. They've got long tails and short wings, which make them really maneuverable. And they can move fast. They ambush birds at the feeder. They'll, they'll perch somewhere nearby so they can see it. Then they'll bomb through and take a bird off the feeder. It's pretty exciting. As a young bird, uh, they look a little bit different. They have streaks instead of that reddish breast. And instead of the blue-gray on the back, they've got this kind of scalloping cinnamon color. Same bird, though, just uh, hasn't gotten its mature plumage yet. They nest in neighborhoods pretty regularly. And uh, while they're on the nest, they can be very noisy. So you might actually get a good look at the family if they're nesting in your neighborhood. But uh, if you see all the birds scatter suddenly, it probably means there's a predator around, whether it's a cat or a cooper's hawk. Um, they sense the danger. And here's some film of uh, one actually visiting uh, a bird bath. Hawks need to bathe too. This is probably on a hot summer day. So pretty great creature, um, and it does it does strike fear in the hearts of all the birds that visit your feeders, which is why it's important to know where to put your feeder. Um, you want to provide some shelter for the birds so they can quickly get away if they sense danger. These are both immature Cooper's hawks, just to give you a sense of what they look like in flight. And uh, one of the things they really like is to, they like to eat morning doves. Uh, you know the morning dove, of course, we'll get to that in a moment. But right now, <laughs> in fact, we're going to talk about morning dove. This is a really abundant species, um, distant relative of the passenger pigeon, much smaller and um, you know, much more numerous now, of course. They have this long, beautiful tail, uh, this soft camel color, and uh, the, the crown of the male 
has this powdery blue color um, of the adult. And if you maybe you can see on the neck, there's a tiny bit of pinkish coppery iridescence. So this can be a really stunning bird. Uh, but for the most part, For the most part, it's uh, kind of a dinner for a Cooper's Hall. I wanted to play that call for you because mourning is is uh, spelled M-O-U-R, as in to mourn, to cry, to weep. And uh, an easy way to remember the mourning dove is that, that beautiful kind of soft, sad, whistling sound that it makes. Here you get a good look at that pointed tail. And a young bird looks like a scruffy adult. And here's a little footage of one moving. <clears throat> House finch. I would guess that this is probably the most abundant feeder bird that we have at the ranch at our bird feeders. The males are bright red with a heavy seed crunching bill. And uh, the young males uh, don't have the brilliant red, but they sometimes have a little wash of orange or yellow. Really common bird here. This is a young individual, but it looks very much like a female. And I think here we see a female feeding that same young bird. So this is a very common bird. You see it pretty regularly uh, at bird feeders. And lesser goldfinch also very, very common. I just saw a big flock of lesser goldfinches today at the feeder, probably a dozen birds visiting our Niger seed. They like thistle. This is another, this is young male. <laughs> kind of sounds sad, um, I think, that downward whistle. But here you can see it actually on a thistle plant. This is its favorite food, but it will eat other seeds as well. But if you have a thistle feeder uh, and they find it, it's all over. So these are quite tiny. Uh, these pictures make them look large, but they're they're very tiny little birds. And dark-eyed junco, we saw this before, the, the sparrow um, with the dark hood and the pinkish bill. This is also a really common bird year round in our area. And it's very happy visiting backyards and, and uh, gardens. <clears throat> While most birds sing in spring, I'm already hearing the dark-eyed junco singing. Um, so it's uh, another key you can use for it. So this looks like a perfect field mark, wouldn't you say? These white outer tail feathers. When you see this, you know you're looking at a junco, especially if you're seeing something in your backyard. This is probably going to be a junco. So that's a key feature, as is the dark head and the pinkish bill and the brown back. Here's one. You watch carefully, you'll see him flicking his tail open slightly. The young birds have spots. We won't see these until spring, but they could be kind of confusing because we get used to looking for that plain gray breast of the juncos, but um, the young ones have spots. Song sparrows are less common in people's gardens. However, we have a lot at our uh, ranch headquarters in Cupertino. So I wanted to share these with you. These are streaky brown sparrows, rather small. And if you have them in your neighborhood, they'll probably visit your feeder. <clears throat> We've had some in our backyard. And they have a beautiful song. I just love that. It's one of my favorite species. So we're moving through the sparrows now. The white crown sparrow is probably the easiest to recognize because it's got black and white crown stripes. And it has what we call wing bars. There's another kind of field mark on the wings to look for. These, these rows of white dots on the wing, they form a row or a bar. The, the adults have black and white on the crown. As this one does, you'll hear the song now. <clears throat> 
what's fun about the um, white crown sparrow is it's only here during fall and winter. So this is a migrant species that comes from Alaska. And um, chances are you can see them pretty easily by just going outside or going to uh, an, area, an area where there, there's food. So the young bird has tan stripes on its crown, but it usually hangs out with the adults. So you'll recognize it that way. And similar to that is the golden crown sparrow, which also comes from Alaska and is here only during the fall and winter. You can see the golden crown here really, really well. It's even prettier when it's in its full breeding plumage. And this song to me sounds very easy to recognize. I think you'll recognize it. Yeah, that was really loud. Um, kind of sounds like Three Blind Mice or the um, jingle from Campbell's Soup. So if you know either of those songs, you'll recognize what I'm saying. The three descending notes, quite sad and melodious. <laughs> All these video footages were taken at our ranch in Cupertino. American Robin, <clears throat> one of the most familiar birds in the world, I think. Um, this is a large thrush with a red breast. It's very vivid on the breeding plumaged male. The female is a little more subdued color-wise, but it make out the same pattern. So that's a pretty familiar song, kind of tweedledee, tweedledum, or cheery up or cheery loo, something like that. Robins are famous for pulling out uh, worms in the moist grass. And right now, with all the rains we've been having, we've had hundreds of robins at the ranch. We've got a big meadow in front of the headquarters. Hundreds of robins there sometimes. And uh, while they're here year round, in winter we seem to get more that are coming from the north in search of good food uh, like worms. And they love toyin and they love coffee berry. So we'll find them feasting on those berries. <clears throat> And they are, this, like I said, it's a pretty big thrust, and uh, we, they form pretty big groups on golf courses and playing fields. Any place where they can find uh, food in the grass, whether it's insects or worms. And another thrush is the western bluebird. It doesn't look anything like the robin, but it's very closely related. Now the male is a brilliant, um, luminous blue, and it eats berries as well. The female is a, a softer color combination of pale blue and pale rust. They form fairly, fairly good feeding groups. A rather simple call. Like all thrushes, bluebirds lay bluish eggs. And uh, it's easy to recognize a thrush nest when you see uh, medium-sized bluish eggs in it like that. So it's kind of fun to know uh, that they also lay eggs like that. In the spring, you'll start to see some with spots. These are the young birds. And uh, they love mealworms and caterpillars. So if you're offering those or they're available in your, in your neighborhood, you'll see the bluebirds as well. This used to be an uncommon species, but because of the nest box activities that SCVS is leading in the uh, Bluebird Recovery Program, which is a national group, uh, we've seen uh, good numbers of, of bluebirds uh, making it to adulthood. So the last bird I wanted to talk about is the great blue heron. It's very unlikely you're going to have this in your backyard, but uh, it's such a familiar, such a charismatic species, and it's large, four and a half to five feet tall, so big deal. And um, it'll stand stock still in the water, uh, it'll grab um, in uh, aquatic mammals and fish and crayfish and all kinds of things it can find in the water. But it's also perfectly at home in a meadow where it's going to find voles and mice, etc. So it doesn't really need to be near water. Um, you could find it on the edge of a golf course too. And I've actually seen one choke down an entire ground squirrel. And that was uh, probably a lot of work to do that. But uh, they have a, a seven foot wingspan. So this is a great big animal. And uh, if you didn't already know it, you know it now. And it 
kind of sounds like the way I would expect uh, a, a pterosaur to sound like. So those are the, I think that was 24 birds, I'm not sure, 24 birds that are really, really common and worth knowing about before you head into um, a great backyard bird count or you start birding in your backyard or neighborhood. But I want to tell you about a couple of apps very quickly that might make your um, evolution into a, a, a fully, um, fully addicted bird watcher that might help. So Merlin. Merlin is a free app that you can get from iTunes and Google Play. <clears throat> and what it does is you start to uh, identify a bird. Of course, the phone knows where you are. And it knows because of that, it knows the birds that are likely to be seen. You enter a date. And you you pick a, a relative size. In this case, I saw a very small bird and it had a lot of yellow on it. And it was eating at the feeder and then it spits out uh, a few recommendations. And the recommendation on the top of the list was lesser goldfinch and that is exactly the bird that I was testing this feature on. So this is my bird and it, it pinpoints it on the map. And I have the idea, I have the option of saving it to my life list, which I do. And you can see here that I've seen lesser yellow, a lesser goldfinch 1019 times. Uh, the number there to the on the right hand side of the screen. So that's kind of fun to know as well, but it'll keep a permanent record of your sightings. The other really fun thing that it does is sound ID. So you open the app up and you open sound ID and you start recording. It's going to start listening to the birds in your area and it's going to start listening to cars and planes too. And within a short period of time, it's probably going to recognize some of the birds that it's picking up. In this case, house finch and dark eyed junco. And I was watching to make sure this was correct, and it was absolutely correct. So, because it's artificial intelligence, there's a strong possibility that it'll make a mistake at some point, but this is really a good feature, and it's absolutely better than nothing when you're starting to learn. Other resources I'd like you to know about our nature shop at the McClellan Ranch has got uh, bird books, shirts, cards, seeds, feeders, books um maps hats all kinds of wonderful things that uh will get you started birding most notably i think one of those field guides there on the left hand side of the screen might be good you're also going to find our checklist there and this is really important because this will help you figure out what's supposed to be seen in your area when you open a checklist you're going to see a list of names and you're going to see bars uh, on to the right of that and those bars indicate the bird's status each month of the year. So you can see that the dark eyed junco is present year round and it's present in pretty big numbers. So that's what we call a resident species. And we also see wintering species like the two crown sparrows, the white crown and the golden crown. They disappear during the spring and summer. It's because they're going to Alaska to breed and by on the opposite side of that coin, we have hooded oriole, which is here only during the spring and summer. So that's actually breeding here, and it's coming from Mexico. So there's a lot you can learn from a checklist. And a, a website that I direct you to is allaboutbirds.org. You can type in the name of a bird you think you might be seeing, or maybe that the app says you've seen, or uh, something your field guide indicates you might have seen. Uh, type in the name, go to the page, see some options of uh, pictures and make hear the sound. You're also going to get a good picture of the map and some text about the bird to help you learn about it. <clears throat> and even some more idea tips if you'd like. So to prepare for the great backyard bird count, which is coming up in just a few days, um, I would recommend that you look at this list of birds that I talked about tonight. I think this is 24, 24. Take a look at these birds in your field guide or on the website allaboutbirds.org. And you can even find all these birds on our website at scvs.org. So look at those, study up a little bit. Don't be daunted by the number of facts and things. Just get a sense of it. Let the book, the pictures, the map wash over you and, and some of it will sink in. Go ahead and download the two apps, the Merlin Bird ID and eBird. Remember, Merlin Bird ID is for identification. eBird is a logging 
application. So what it does is it allows you to keep track of your birds um, in a more thorough fashion. So you can watch our eBird video to help you get started with that if you go to our website and you'll see an option for scvas.learn and you'll come to this page which has a series of classes and videos and things like that and down down the page a little bit you'll see a video called eBird part one that's a free video and it'll get you started with how to use eBird why it exists how it's helpful and how to make the most of it <clears throat> and the uh, title slide looks like this to help you recognize it but it's about an hour long and um I think you'll enjoy it. There are other videos there that you might enjoy too. Some are free and some are fee-based, but we do classes all the time on bird groups, seasonal birding, uh, habitats, etc. So there's a lot happening at scbis.learn.org rather. And still other resources, our YouTube channel has tons of videos that Carolyn and I recorded mostly during the pandemic when uh, we had a lot of time at home and we were playing with our uh, computers and trying to figure out how to how to produce compelling video content for our members. So you'll see lots of fun stuff there. But most importantly, you want to join our eBird workshop this Friday or Saturday. So it's at 10 a.m. at the ranch and we'll it'll be about an hour and we'll take you through the various steps on eBird. This is what our ranch looks like. My office is right there in the back and uh, we're in Cupertino starts at 10 o'clock on Friday and Saturday. And just to give you a real uh, quick uh, snapshot of eBird, you start a checklist uh, by hitting the green button. It knows what time it is. And you're going to select a place where you're birding, and then you start logging the birds. And what it does while you're walking is it'll track your path. So you can really see a nice map of where you went. Now, this is not public. People will not see your map, so there's no security issue there, so rest assured. Uh, but your data uh, about the birds you see will go into the public database, and you'll be helping to support community science by helping everybody um, learn more about the birds around them. And it allows Cornell to create these wonderful maps which tell you where the bird lives and a sense of what the population density is. The intensity of the purple color means it's there in larger numbers than it is in the pale purple. This is our acorn woodpecker, the bird we started off with. So if you've got more questions about birding uh, or eBird or uh, Merlin or any of the things we talked about tonight, uh, visit scvs.org, send me an email, uh, give me a call. I'd love to hear from you. I really look forward to seeing you on Friday and Saturday. Uh, for the eBird workshop, and we've got other things lined up for you to enjoy 